In addition to the US, Japan has also been making efforts to regain its presence in chip production. So how do you evaluate its moves? Japan, like the rest of the world, you know, knows that it's critical for their own economy, uh, as well as for their manufacturing companies within Japan, they all want to have local supply. So I think it's great to see Japan and Korea and the US and Europe all work on building out more semiconductor capacity because there is going to be this ongoing need for it. So I think they obviously have a very long history of being able to do it. It's hard. It's expensive. It's going to, it's not going to be an easy road for them. But they do have a history of that. And of course, they have a lot of electronic companies based in Japan who purchase these chips. So logically, it makes sense for them, same as Korea, to have local suppliers. So I think you'll absolutely see that. I think you'll see some of the big same names. The wouldn't surprise me to see Intel and Samsung and TSMC build in Japan, as well as local Japanese companies who have a long history doing chips back in the early days of the semiconductor business. TSMC has been expanding its manufacturing capabilities in Japan. So do you think this is a strategy that Samsung should also follow? I, I think it does make sense. I know that there's a long, difficult political history between Japan and Korea. And so sometimes that can influence the way business is done between those countries. But again, if you think about it logically, I think it does make sense uh, for the company to do it. And so it's it's a question of, you know, figuring those things out and dealing with some of the you know painful history of the past and figuring out how to move forward. The Biden administration has announced that it'll award Samsung with 6.4 billion US dollars, which is the third largest in scale after Intel and TSMC. And the company is expanding its investment in the US from $17 billion to roughly $45 billion. Can you share your thoughts on the size of the subsidy and what are the implications of Samsung's investment expansion for the company's business? I mean, it's great news for Samsung. I mean, you know, the CHIPS Act was uh, promised a while ago and it, it took a while for the US to finally start to give out the money. But we saw it, you know, first it was Global Foundries here in the US, and then it was Intel. Then we just had TSMC like a week ago, and now finally we have Samsung. And both, you know, the Samsung number is, is a big number. It's very similar to the TSMC number, which is great because now, you know, that gives each of these companies the ability to help build local factories. And I think it's recognized worldwide that right now the semiconductor industry is in a situation where it's not globally diverse. And, you know, things happen. We just saw the earthquake in Taiwan. Thankfully, the TSMC and other factories were okay, but that's, you know, those things are going to happen. It's on the ring of fire. I mean, that's, that's where Taiwan is. So you have to think about that. Not to mention, of course, the geopolitical situation between China and Taiwan. And it's great to have a bunch of chip factories in Korea, but it's important to have them in Europe and in the U.S. as well. So I think the entire world is better off when there are chip making facilities all over the place so that if something happens in one place, it's you know balanced by something happening somewhere else. So I think it's a, it's a really important move by the US government. At the same time, I think it's important that they're doing the same thing in Europe and other parts of the world, because I think we're all gonna be better off if there is a diverse supply of companies that can build these chips in different locations. And that's just gonna make that entire tech supply chain more uh, stable and more reliable. And that's gonna be very important as we move to the future because semiconductors are in everything. You know, we talk about mobile phones and we talk about servers and PCs, but they're in cars, they're in medical equipment, they're in household appliances, they're in toys, they're in everything. So you've gotta have a huge uh, supply chain and a very diverse one in order to continue doing the, the technological advancement that we've all enjoyed. So I think it's really important and I think it's great. And the, and the number for, for Samsung here in the U.S. Is, is a very big one. And I think that says a lot about the opportunities that I, the U.S. government sees for Samsung to help uh, with that global semiconductor market. What are the implications of the size of the funding from the U.S. government for the competitiveness of Samsung, Intel, and TSMC? Look, it's good for everybody. I mean, at the mm -hmm. end of the day, as big as those numbers are, right, you know, $6 billion and $9 billion for, for Intel or up to 11, including uh, loans. I mean, those are huge numbers, but they're still a fraction of what it costs to build a single factory. You know, and these companies are all building multiple factories, but they're important because, you know, the other thing is what we've seen is certainly in Taiwan and definitely in China, 
there have been a lot of government subsidies to support their tech industry. And we haven't really seen that as much in Western countries and in the US and in Europe. And I think there's an awareness that that is gonna be required, at least for a while, to kind of bring up uh, the manufacturing capacity uh, around the world. So um, I, I think it, it, it helps, but you know, as big as the numbers are, they're still small compared to the total amount of money that these companies have to spend. So, but it does give them more confidence to say, okay, now we know we've got the support here. And it's not just the money because, you know, semiconductors, it's a very complicated ecosystem. So it's not about just their fab, but then it's what about the suppliers, the people who can give them the raw materials to build these chips and move them around and do all the various pieces that are required. So by having each of these companies get more money for specific locations, it will hopefully build a whole ecosystem of people with the right skills who want to move to those parts of the country or those parts of the world and other companies to provide the uh, ecosystem of other components and supplies that these chip companies will make. So. In the long run, I think it's a it's a great thing for all three of these companies. Um, it's not going to make or break any of them, but it certainly helps in all cases. Now that we know how much the U.S. government is providing to major advanced chip makers, how successful do you expect the subsidies will be in bringing chip manufacturing back to the U.S., and particularly for it to produce 20% of leading edge chips by 2030? And do you think there's a need to legislate a second CHIPS Act? I think the, the money being spent is going to go a long way towards uh, increasing that U.S. share of those uh, of cutting edge uh, semiconductor fabs. Whether it's enough to, to make it to 20 percent by 2030, it's hard to say. Again, these are multi-year projects and it's going to, you know, it's going to be a couple of years before we really know how far along things are. I do think it will probably take a CHIPS Act you know, part two to really get to that number. So I do think at some point we probably will see another one, but I think people are going to wait. And I think the government, you know, is going to want to see how this first round of money is being spent and how successful it is. If they see progress being made, I think you're going to see them much more willing to open up their wallets again to, to hand out more money. If they don't see a lot of progress, for obvious reasons, I think they're going to be a little bit more hesitant. But if things go well, and I certainly hope they will for all of those companies, then I think they will recognize, again, that the need for subsidies is not a one-time shot, but something that's probably going to have to happen a couple of times. And certainly a CHIPS Act II would make sense a couple of years down the road if this first money is spent well. Korea Science and Technology Policy Institute argued in a recent report that paradoxically, Washington's chip subsidies will be beneficial to China. It claimed that the grants will encourage companies to expand their investments, lead to oversupply, lower unit prices, and that in the end, China, which is the largest importer of semiconductors, will benefit. Would you agree with this view? Well, it, it's an interesting perspective. I don't necessarily agree with it. It is true that the nature of the semiconductor business, memory in particular, has gone through cycles of oversupply and undersupply for decades. And that's not gonna change because the problem is, if you think about it, a demand curve tends to be smooth. When you add manufacturing capacity, it's a step function. And so those two rarely align. And there are gonna certainly be cases where there are too many chips versus the current demand. And there are other cases where we've seen where there's not enough chips versus current demand. So that's going to be an ongoing problem, and that will absolutely exist even with this chips money and even with an expanded semiconductor market. But more importantly, again, if we think strategically, if we think geopolitically about the need to diversify, I think you're going to find that a lot of companies will be happy to purchase chips from other locations in order to build up a stronger supply chain. Because in the long run, Companies who have a long-term vision know that they need to have that. So even if that means they pay slightly higher prices or uh, you know, we end up with a situation where the, the pricing isn't as great, I don't think that necessarily is going to benefit from China because the other thing that's not forget is that's assuming that China can get access to all of these chips. In the current environment, a lot of these advanced chips, they won't allow to be exported to China. So that doesn't benefit China if they can't even buy these more advanced chips. So I don't think that's necessarily going to be true. I understand some of the logic, but I think in the long run, uh, it's going to be better for everybody around the world, uh, including many countries and companies that are based outside of China.
Can you share your thoughts on Samsung's preliminary first quarter earnings and implications for memory market rebound? It was great news from Samsung, their first quarter preliminary earnings. Of course, we don't have the details, but looked really great. And the implication was a lot of it was around the memory business. And that's, you know, we're seeing that reflected in a couple of ways. We're starting to see the smartphone sh shipments start to go up overall on a worldwide basis. Expectation is we'll start to see some modest increase in PCs and servers and data center as well, all of which require a lot of memory. And of course, there's a lot of excitement around GPU specific data accelerators, you know, particularly from NVIDIA and those use HBM3, you know, the high bandwidth memory. Now, Samsung's been a small player there, but they're starting, they're ent entering the market, you know, and the expectation, of course, is that that's a huge opportunity for them because it's been dominated by, by Hynix and Micron here in the U.S. I think it's, it's a very good sign that across the board that, you know, when you see the component suppliers start to have good numbers, that's telling you that means people up the chain are buying more of these chips building more products, and that's good for the tech industry overall. Samsung's management faced criticism at a shareholder meeting in March for losing its leadership in the chip market as it lags behind an HBM development. And Kyung gae hyun who's the president and CEO of Samsung Electronics Device Solutions Division, recently stated that due to the efforts of our dedicated team, HBM leadership is coming to us. So how successful do you expect Samsung to be in catching up with its competitors? I don't know specifically the details of where you know, how far along Samsung is versus the competitors. But look, they have a long history of being able to build high quality memory chips. I have zero doubt that they will do very well and they'll be seen as a very important alternative. As with any market, you want to have good, strong competitors. Samsung has been extremely uh, competitive in other parts of the memory market. I'm sure they will do very well uh, for HBM3.